He started racing in 1952. And, you know, it was like Picasso, like a great artist doing his work. And he was in that car, and he was doing his work. But, you know, he couldn't get the support where other drivers that we were competing against had major sponsorship. He did everything that he did out of his own pocket. And as children, we didn't have that leisure time. You know, we couldn't go to the playground. He said to us, I need you at the garage. I can remember him getting injured, and he'd just take axle grease and put it in the cut and keep working. But he wasn't allowed to race at certain speedways. He had death threats not to come to Atlanta. And they had to say, look, if I leave in a pine box, that's what I got to do, but I'm going to race. I can remember him racing in Jacksonville, and he beat them all. But they wouldn't drop the checkered flag. And then when they did drop the checkered flag, they had my father in third place. One of the main reasons that they gave was there was a white beauty queen, and they always kissed the driver. He finally got the money. But, uh, of course, the trophy was gone. The fans were gone. The beauty queens were gone. Did he ever consider not racing anymore? Never. That was one of my daddy's saying. When it's too tough, everybody else is just right for me. Like I can remember one time when uh, we were racing the Atlanta 500, and um, he was sick. He needed an operation. And I said, Daddy, we don't have to race today. He whispered to me and said, lift my legs up and put me in the car. He drove 500 miles that day. He always felt like some days going to get his big break. But uh, for 20 years, nobody mentioned Wendell Scott. But he didn't let it drive him crazy. I think that's what made him so great. Uh, he chose to be a race car driver, and he was going to race until he couldn't race no more. 